Lloyd Souter visited St Hilda's in Oxford in the early months of 1899. That is exactly 120 years ago. She lived there as a student while observing the education of women and girls in England. St Hilda's was then quite new, quite small and financially uncertain. Despite these disadvantages, St Hilda's had established itself in the academic community in Oxford. This had not always been the case, so I must begin my story in 1893, six years before Umaid Suda's visit. In 1893, there had been three halls of residence for women for higher education. These had been founded about ten years earlier by Oxford academics and their families. There were also a few non-resident students who lived with their families and friends. None of these women students or their teachers were members of the university. Only men could be members of the university and take its degrees. However, there were some special arrangements whereby women students could attend university lectures and take university examinations. Although the results in these examinations were published, they did not lead to a degree. The arrangements for the women's students were made and controlled by a committee of both men and women, which I shall call for simplicity the association. The three existing halls had been approved by the association, and it was the aim of the association to persuade the university to admit women to full membership. And now I come to St Hilda's and its founders, Dorothea Beale. Dorothea Beale was an educational reformer, a national and indeed international authority on the secondary education of girls. Most famously, she was the principal of a large, highly successful school called Cheltenham Ladies' College in a town, Cheltenham, about 50 miles west of Oxford. At Cheltenham, Dorothea Beale had also established the first resident college for the training of women teachers in secondary schools. Women at this training college could also study for the external degrees of London University. But Dorothea Beale believed that they sadly missed the lectures, libraries and discussions to be found in a university city. So she decided, at her own expense, to provide an outpost for the Cheltenham Training College in Oxford. She planned that students would spend a few weeks in Oxford attending lectures, but they would not take university examinations. This project was entirely unacceptable to the Association for Higher Education in Women. The association saw immense damage could be done to its own plans to obtain full membership for women into the university. Dorothy Beale, it appeared, was planning to bring to Oxford young women with no fixed course of study and therefore they were likely to waste their time in frivolous activities and give a bad reputation to all women students. The association always insisted on very strict disciplinary rules and demanded a very great deal of hard work from its students. 
the principals of the three women's halls were also hostile to Dorothy Beer's plans. They believed that Dorothea Beale would offer unfair competition in the recruitment of students, which were rather scarce at the time. So the association told Dorothea Beale that her plan was not acceptable. However, Dorothea Beale was a very determined woman. She modified her plan so that students could take the degrees of Oxford University bought a large old house in Oxford, called it St Hilda's, and admitted the first seven students in October 1893. Dorothea Beale appointed as its first principal Mrs Esther Burroughs, a widow living in Cheltenham and closely associated with the Cheltenham Ladies College. Mrs Burroughs made up for her lack of academic qualifications with her great diplomatic skills, which enabled her to dispel much of the distrust between the association and the women's halls on one hand and Miss Beale on the other. Mrs Burroughs' firm code of discipline and behaviour and her insistence on serious hard work persuaded the association that St Hilda was doing no damage at all to the cause of women's higher education. After four years, St Hilda's was allowed to call itself a hall on exactly the same level as the three existing colleges founded earlier. I beg your pardon the three existing halls founded earlier. It is clear that Dorothea Beale intended St Hilda's as a hall for Cheltenham, students in training as teachers. But this didn't happen. It was expensive to spend time in Oxford and students no doubt wanted to get on to gain their teaching qualifications and so start their teaching careers. Of the first seven students at St Hilda's, five had been students at Cheltenham Ladies College, one had been educated at Oxford High School and one had been educated at home. This shows that even in its very earliest days, Dorothea Beale had difficulty finding enough students from Cheltenham to make St Hilda's financially viable. To increase income, strenuous efforts were made to publicise St Hilda's and recruit students from other British schools and from overseas. Despite these efforts, St Hilda's could not pay its way. As I said earlier, Dorothea Beale was a very determined woman. She was also a very shrewd businesswoman. She put in place some rather complicated financial arrangements which ensured that St Hilda's was subsidised by the training college in Cheltenham for the next 20 years. For the first 12 years, all important decisions at St Hilda's were taken by Dorothea Beale. She chose, she chose the principal, the students and the architect when the original house was extended. She even chose the furniture and drew up the schedule of daily work for the housemaid. The very first student at St Hilda's was Christine, the daughter of Mrs Esther Burroughs, the principal. Christine Burroughs was already a student in 1983 at one of the other women's halls. She was studying history. Dorothea Beale insisted that Christine joined her mother at St Hilda's to look after the new students and 
to introduce her mother to the rather special conventions and traditions of Oxford. Christine Burroughs completed her own studies in a year and then stayed on at St Hilda's to help with the students and also to act as tutor for the students reading history. She was eventually given the title of vice principal. When her mother retired in 1910, Christine Burroughs became principal of St Hilda's Hall. By 1910, St Hilda's was firmly part of the scheme of higher education for women in Oxford. It was now larger, with more rooms and a good list of applicants. It had appointed its own tutor in English, and when Christine became principal, she was replaced as history tutor by a woman who already had a distinguished career in research. Dorothea Beale had died in 1910, that is, ten years earlier. Academic decisions at St Hilda's were now taken by the principal under the control of a council in Oxford which included senior members of the university. But still women were not members of the university and could not be awarded its degrees. There had been several attempts to change this, but there had been fierce opposition, not all of it, from the men in the university. Even Dorothea Beale had opposed it because the university insisted on a substantial training in Latin and Greek for its young men and she believed that introducing this training into girls' schools would be a great mistake. At heart, she was a school teacher, and her primary concern was the success of Cheltenham Ladies College. After the First World War in 1920, everything changed. Women were admitted to the university. Many outdated university admission requirements were removed. There was much less dependence on Latin and Greek. New subjects were introduced into the university first degree syllabus. The introduction of modern languages was of particular interest to women. Becoming part of the university brought great opportunities for St Hilda's. It became a college, not just a hall. It doubled its numbers by acquiring a neighbouring building on the banks of the River Charwell, which had been vacated by a teacher training college. St Hilda's tutors became fellows and took a full part in the examining and lecturing programme of the university. The college broke the link with Cheltenham, but thereby lost its subsidy. St Hilda's was now on its own but it was just large enough to pay its way. For the next 20 years, the college built up its reputation for scholarship in the university, the academic world and in schools. It was particularly successful in history and in English studies, and many of its students went on to research and teach in these subjects. The demand for places was high and students were selected from an entrance examination. The number of students grew and soon more rooms were needed and so hostels were set up nearby. The only major addition to the main campus in the years between the wars was a library with a few student rooms over it. In 1950, 
a new building program began. This coincided with the opportunity to join up the two neighbouring sites on which the college had existed for 30 years. Two new large buildings were put up, student numbers rapidly increased and there was an explosion in the number of tutors. Many of the tutors were now joint appointments with the university. There was a significant increase in the number of scientists, both tutors and students. In the mid-50s, the last of the university's restrictions on the women's colleges were lifted. And at last, St Hilda's had joined the older colleges of Oxford as an equal. In the 1980s, the university decided to expand its postgraduate work while keeping unchanged the number of students on first degree courses. That decision had a considerable impact at St Hilda's. One obvious result was the arrival of many more students from overseas and many rather older students. Social facilities were built, but it was a challenge to provide sufficient accommodation. The ultimate solution was to build modern blocks of rooms off-site, but close to the main college buildings. Another important change in the university came in the 1970s when the men's colleges began admitting women both as students and as tutors. Gradually, by 2000, all colleges, except St Hilda's, admitted both men and women. Why did St Hilda's hold out? Its reasons were more concerned with senior academic posts for women in Oxford than with educational arguments. Eventually, financial considerations overruled all other arguments, and St Hilda's first admitted men as fellows and students in 2008. The change all went very smoothly. The present principal is a man, Sir Gordon Duff. As Dorothea Beale had discovered in 1893, the only way to survive in Oxford was to conform with the standard conventions. At the moment, there are 400 undergraduates and 220 graduate students. Roughly half of the students are men. It is interesting that students studying science are more likely to be men than women. If you visited St Hilda's today, you would find that part of it was a huge building site where foundations are being prepared for a substantial new building. This will replace old and worn out buildings to provide rooms needed for research, teaching and living. This is just the beginning of a major programme to provide more undergraduate accommodation on the main campus. Dorothea Beale, the founder of St Hilda's, always insisted on excellence, achievement and first-class teaching. She would not now recognise all the buildings, but I suspect she would be very pleased that the college was still dedicated to her objectives. <laughs>